Hello and welcome to episode number 268 of the Armin Show podcast, where it is just getting cooler and cooler out here. On this episode, who do we have from New York? You may know her as soon after you get to know her, Dr. Mariam Bakir, MD. Welcome yeah. to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. This is a wonderful thing. I am glad to have you on. You are in New York. What area of New York? I was there. We met each other there. Long live yeah. that area. Yeah. Where are you at? I live in downtown Brooklyn. We met in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. But I live in downtown Brooklyn, close to Brooklyn Bridge, actually. And Brooklyn is also where I work. Mm-hmm. So it just made sense to find an apartment here. We, we got a really good deal here. I love the neighborhood. Now, information for the folks. When she says we, companion Shan, who was oh, on yes, the show yes, before. Of course, of course. <laughs> Classic. Uh, I mean, we, I mean, your previous guest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Previous guest and similar personality type Shan uh, yes. on the show. You're in Brooklyn now. And have you enjoyed it thus far? Or do you plan to leave Brooklyn? Do you plan to stay there? What are your thoughts as far as that area? So I love it here. I love it here. Um, Honestly, when I was not living in New York and I used to come here just as a tourist, yes. um, most tourists uh, just focus on Manhattan and I did the same. Um, and, their, and their exploration of Brooklyn is usually just limited to Brooklyn Bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, so people don't really get to know the rest of Brooklyn, I think, um, if they're just coming here as tourists. Um, and I did the same when I was visiting New York um, before living here. Um, but thanks to the fact that I got a job in Brooklyn, I started looking for, um, good neighborhoods in Brooklyn. And frankly, I didn't know about downtown Brooklyn before I moved here. And I was almost embarrassed that I never knew about this wonderful neighborhood here. Um, it's, uh, extremely accessible. It's very close to Brooklyn Bridge Park. There is a very accessible um, subway station here that goes pretty much everywhere um and it has everything so we have a beautiful park here we have we have restaurants and bars here we have um whole foods here (laughs) um which um yeah so and and they have some really nice apartment buildings in this area as well so um yeah so that's where i've been for the past three years Although, well, two and a half, three years um, ending this year in December. Um, although now my next job may require me to move a little up north since now my new hospital is going to be in the Bronx. Oh. Um, so if, I don't know, I'll see. I, I'm, I'm not moving anytime soon. So if I don't mind the commute, I might just stay in downtown Brooklyn. Otherwise, we've already started looking for places in Manhattan um to just make my commute a bit more sustainable that makes sense we like sustainability out here when something's going well you want to maintain it in some form exactly exactly it's going well so i really i would really miss this building actually whenever i leave um and in fact we've already looked for like different apartments in the same neighborhood if i feel the transportation is something manageable i might just stick around but let's (laughs) see yeah no i love it here it's just um and also as an immigrant, someone from um, outside the United States, I also felt that just generally, it was very easy to gel in here. It was just, well, that's pretty much all of New York, but um, it was, um, yeah, it was just very, it was just very fun to be in right on day one. So yeah, love it here. There's a fun factor to it. That's yeah. cool. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned immigrant. Tell us the story of that leading to where you currently are, some of your background leading to where you are. Right. So the story is, um, I'm originally from Pakistan. I'm from um, the biggest city, actually, Karachi. Um, And that also connects with the fact that I like being in New York so much because I feel that Karachi and New York have many similarities. Um, Karachi is also like the biggest metropolitan city of the country where everybody comes to look for job opportunities. Um, so we have around 20 to 22 million people, those we have counted <laughs> just in that city. So I come from a very busy, hustling, bustling, um, disorganized city, um, where, which also doesn't sleep at all. <laughs> so that's where I am from originally. I was actually born in Iran. We've talked about this once. 
my, my country of birth. Yep, I've actually, I was actually born there, but I didn't live there for more than two or three years of my life. Um, then, so I've, I'm a Pakistani, um, and uh, I went to medical school in Pakistan, and then I decided to um, go abroad for my physician training, which is called residency here. Mm-hmm. And uh, United States is one of the, uh, like, it's usually where people, you know, uh, if they want to go and get um, further medical training, U.S. by far is the country that um, takes most immigrants for mm. physician training. Um, so yeah, that's um, um, yeah, that's that's the story. Now, here's the thought that came to my mind: If you went back to Harachi at this current moment, what's the biggest thing you'd be missing from your current place at New York? Like, what would be the biggest shift that you would notice? I think the biggest shift in Karachi would be um, just the sudden lack of freedom and independence, despite the fact that even if you're financially independent, it's just that as a woman um, in Pakistan, you just lose the ability to um, just spontaneously make plans, just do whatever you want without thinking twice. So that would be, I think, the biggest thing that I enjoyed when I moved here and I would miss if I ever go to Karachi. Um, For men, it's still different. But as a woman, I always had to think twice, thrice before planning something, going somewhere, um, what to wear, where to go, where to not go, who to go with, whether or not to go alone. Um, So in New York, for example, I've... I've been out at 3 a.m. even. So um, so I've gotten kind of used to that independence, that spontaneity of making plans about anything I want to do. Um, um, yeah, so that would be something that I always craved when I was there. It's difficult. You, you can justify that in many ways as well. It, it, it is a matter of safety um, many a times and you have to be careful there. And I would always advise people to be careful there. But it's just something that I just didn't have to think about um, when I moved here, for example. So yeah, I think that would be something that I would really miss. You have way more autonomy in your current location. Yeah, just making making decisions about whatever, be it going to the grocery store three minutes away to someplace an hour and a half away, just doing whatever I want, anything I've scheduled, a meeting, activity, whatever, grocery, like just from big to small is just... Um, it's just that spontaneity, the independence, the ability to not think about anything. Um, it's just very liberating. And it's, it's difficult to exercise that when you're a woman um, in a country like that. So, yeah. I very much like that concept. When I think about a person and the things they want to do and then the distance from them to that is the inefficiency in their life. Like, oh man, I have to, but I have to double think it. Oh man, I want to do that, but I can't do it right now. That just cuts off part of the point of your existence. So it's nicer when you get closer to that, where it's like, I want to do it. Well, you can do that. And then you go, and then yeah. do that. Yeah. 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 It's very exactly. freeing. Exactly. Exactly. So right now, he- similarly, there are many things that are about Pakistan and Karachi that I miss when I'm here. Um, What's one of those? Um, Pakistan and Karachi is like, Honestly, as much as I love my freedom, I really miss the pampering people get there. Um, the what people very, get there? The pampering. Like we uh, just, I was very pampered all my life there. I didn't have to think about anything related to my household activities, for example. It's just the, the your, your family's around. Um, it's and, more collective. And our families are all like, you know, our families, like my immediate family has, like I have three siblings and, and, and my parents and everything. But then you have, an ex- you have a very beautiful concept of extended family in Pakistan. Um, so it's like your family is basically 25 to 30 people at a minimum. Um, uh, so it's just, you know, people meeting together, dining together, uh, the fun activities every weekend. You don't really have to go outside your circle. You already have so many family members to have fun with, your cousins and this and that. And then with that also comes the fact that... Um, um, there's just so many people to help around and stuff that I, I don't know. It's just, although I do feel that like 
it, it, the pampering comes at a cost because, you know, if you're so pampered, then you don't have to think about anything in your household. Like I, I, I never did laundry. I never ironed my clothes whenever I was there. Um, I, I did if I had to, but I never really had to. Um, so, and, and those things just completely change when you start living on your own, of course. Um, so as much as I understand that, um, you need to do that to, to gain that independence that I always craved anyway. I know that I, I, it's there, but, you, but just like when you have so many things piled up, you sometimes do really wish you, you, you had a mom to cook for you. Like, like I would just come home from medical school and my entire table would be like laid out with everything from starters to main course to dessert to milkshake to juices <laughs> everything was just ready and all I had to do was just um, bring myself on the chair <laughs> and that's it and I, I didn't even have to worry about doing the dishes um, and that just completely changes when you move abroad so it, it's it's a mixed feeling because um, as much as I also really appreciate my independence here so with independence you have to realize that you have to do all these things yourself because that's that's part of gaining the independence that I always craved mm -hmm. but when it gets too much when it gets just too much and you have just way too many things to do um you do start craving just that environment in Pakistan where there's so many people to help you around where you have a mother you have a father <laughs> just that yeah so yeah so you see it's just family you miss family and you miss the things they do for you you miss how you can take them for granted um yeah it's a little bit more collectivist not as much individualist yeah absolutely exactly it's very um yeah we like things operate there as a unit you have to yeah exactly it, it's very collectivist it's like, like it's it's a, it's a different way of living life there so mm. um, um yeah we liked it that's a cool feature the differences in nations each nation really has a certain that, and if you have to kind of blend into that or else you probably in other places better fit. Yeah, exactly. Now, after that, you have gone to medical school. Why? Mm -hmm. I always like to check the category. Why a doctor? Why not one of the 800 other options moving forward? Why, why medical? How does that interest you? How does that why, connect with your personality also? Why medical school? So. I have a very uninteresting <laughs> and a very we'll be the judge of that I have a very I have I have a reason that is not that creative and not that interesting okay but, but I also have lots of reasons to back it up so it it stems from the fact that my parents are physicians to begin with mm -hmm their doctors to begin with so i had a very early exposure um to this career um like literally right from childhood i i saw what my parents did mm -hmm. um and and that's where um so that's so basically that that profession was something that i saw day in and day out i saw how my parents worked um at the hospital i saw how they were at home I saw why they were in it, what they were doing, what was it all for. Um, so, so, so naturally, that's just something that draws your attention um, towards this particular profession. But at the same time, I also knew that if I didn't like it, mm -hmm. uh, if I didn't like the kind of lifestyle my parents were leading, if I didn't, if I didn't like the values or the principles they were standing for, um, behind um, being in this profession, I also knew I had the liberty to to be any of the to be to join any of the other eight hundred professions out there. Mm -hmm. So, so even though I was exposed, my biggest uh, motivation, which stands true to date, because there's no way you can do this unless you have that motivation and the passion yourself, because it's a very long road. Medicine is a very long road and you, you need a lot of commitment to get through it. And I don't think you can do it just because your parents are physicians. So, so even though I got that exposure early on um, um, through them, I, I, I paved my way through medical school and medicine at large because I really felt passionate about, um, about healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, 
um, it was, it was, and it was also the fact that if you, if you, um, if you join medical school and if you go into the field of um, medicine and healthcare, um, there are also just so many different possibilities that you can go into there. If you want to be in the um, in the clinical setting, if you want to be a clinician, you have like 20, 25, maybe even 50, like different specialties and subspecialties to go into. Um, if you don't see yourself as a clinician who, who takes care of diseases directly and patient to patient interaction directly, you can go into public health, you can go into global health, you can go into activism, you can go into um, nutrition, you can go into preventive medicine, you can go into um, just so many different opportunities out there that e you can go into healthcare administration, you can go into hospital leadership, you can go into just so many different areas um, by, um, by joining a profession like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I was very young when I went to medical school in, in, in Pakistan, you join medical school when you're 18, actually. So mm -hmm. it's a very young age. Um, and at that time I, I knew this was something that was, that was, that I was very passionate about, but I wasn't like everybody else. I wasn't hundred percent sure exactly what kind of a doctor I'm going to be eventually. But I knew that, you know, if I, if I enter this profession and if I explore it, I know the options are so much that I will find what I love, um, that I will make my way through to be where I want to be. Um, while keeping in mind that whatever I do is, is going to be, um, for the single most important vision of of benefiting people of helping people of being able to do something um i just yeah it was just my way of justifying my existence in this world that i'm here to um i always used to question i don't even know why i'm here <laughs> i didn't ask to come here <laughs> um so if i'm here what am i supposed to do um and it's just this this fire inside me where i feel that just being isolated in your own interests. Um, and you can help people in many ways. So it's not just medicine that helps people. You can help people in, in millions of ways. I don't need, even need to go into that. Mm -hmm. But it was just this love for biology, love for physics and chemistry. I love the sciences. I loved what it meant. I loved humanities. I love talking to people. I love um, exploring um, problems. And it just felt like something that would just amalgamate everything. And with the pace of time, I knew I will eventually find who, what, what my heart really desires. And I'm already there. So, um, yeah. So the exposure, I got it through my, my parents. But it was really my own motivation, my own passion that, that led me through. Because there's no way you can do it just because your parents are also doctors. You need to have that driving force. Because the, the, the road is long. The road is very long. Um, and it's full of um, sacrifices. It's full of um, challenges. It's full of um, obstacles. And you can do it if you really have a certain vision for it. Um, so yeah, that's why I chose it. Mm -hmm. External motivations or pressures can only go so far at some point. Exactly, exactly. exactly. So um, uh, it was... And I, I got exposed to it, so I'm thankful to my parents for that. But I definitely give credit to my own fire inside me for this particular field that led me through to this date. So, my laptop is burning because your fire is coming through it at this time. I like that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually reasonably temperature at this time. Classic. Now, that there's some real good messages along. I always like to, if it was up to me, I would break down each message along the way, but there's some good life messages there. Now, uh -huh. you have now taken that through. Recently, you have been a doctor in a very interesting moment, which yep. I will preface slightly with my first visit to New York, transition from normal New York to odd New York, yep. uh, leading up to the moment that you have recently traveled through since then. Now, we have had some sort of virus pass through the earth. And what has been your experience with this in recent months at your medical facility treating patients of that? My experience has been one that I think I'm going to be talking about for generations to come. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's surreal. It's like I can go on and on and I'm, and I'm still in the process of, of really processing what exactly happened. 
um, and what it means to me um, and acknowledging how it has impacted me in every way. Um, so I work at um, one of the largest hospitals in Brooklyn and Brooklyn is one of the most um, populated, it is actually the populated, it's the most populated borough of New York. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I mentioned this because that just, that gives you a sense of exactly what kind of um, um, crisis we went through because we, um, it's a big hospital that attracts most of Brooklyn. Um, so that's where we were. And, and, and my normal days, even pre-COVID, um, were already very challenging. We always had a very high census on a daily basis of patient census. Our patients were always, this is all pre-COVID even. So I'm, I'm trying to give you the background that we were already doing um, some, we were already going through some really, the work we were doing was already very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, where we have, um, I think I read this um, um, study where they felt that um, we have about 30 languages spoken in the hospital. So Brooklyn is such a multicultural, multilingual um, borough that we have so many languages here. Um, so I'm already working at a place that is always beaming with patients. We are always at a high census, extremely complicated cases. Um, our age group used to be at least are, like majority of my patients are 70 and above. So that already brings a lot of complications because by that time you have like 500 million um, issues going on. Um, so it was already a very tense um, uh, environment to work in um, with language barrier so that you're doing all of this with interpreters in between because you're dealing with life and death situations um, um, without the person in front knowing English. So, um, so, you know, so it's, it's a very, it, it's a very challenging environment to work in and then comes in COVID, which basically, <laughs> which basically, I mean, I'm laughing right now, but I've spent my <laughs> months crying. Right. Um, it basically increased, amplified everything five times. Um, the census went up five times. We initially back in March started with naively started with um, restricting our COVID patients to one floor so that we could spare the rest of the hospital and keep them isolated in one area also for infection control purposes. But I don't think that even lasted seven or eight days because by seven, eight days after that, the entire hospital basically became COVID. Um, it was, it was, it was absolutely surreal to see what was going on because um, you know, a typical hospital has multiple different departments, specialties. You have you have um, you have surgery, you have pediatrics, you have um, gynecology, obstetrics. You know, everybody has different floors, different wards, different kinds of patients. Um, surgery has so many um, branches as well. You have orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, trauma surgery, um, general surgery. So every floor has different patients, and within ten days, the entire hospital just had COVID. There was no surgery. There was nobody with cancer. Well, they moved cancer patients overnight, actually. So overnight, they developed a new facility, um, my hospital. Um, they developed facilities or areas to move our cancer patients elsewhere, move our pregnant ladies elsewhere, because we needed space to keep these COVID patients. To, it was, if, you, if you went down into the emergency at that time, it was like, it's exactly like how a war zone would look, because... Um, people were just stacked next to each other because there were so many people that you just didn't have, we just didn't have space to keep them or are you going to keep them? So we created, in fact, in front of my eyes, the baby nursery, that was, I think that was, that was one of the saddest moments that I experienced. Um, the nursery for newborns in front of my eyes was just revamped to create six or seven new beds in that area. So we had to shift our kids elsewhere. Pregnant ladies had to go elsewhere. Our cancer patients had to go elsewhere. All surgeries were disbanded. Um, and the entire hospital of eight floors essentially just was created. And, and I'm pretty impressed by um, what my hospital did to combat this because this was done in front of our eyes um, just to be able to... Um, and then when you have so many patients, you also need as many doctors and nursing staff. So um, typically COVID is taken care of by medicine physicians, which was my primary specialty. 
Um, they're taken care of by emergency physicians in the emergency room. And then when they get admitted, it's the medicine department that takes care of them. But we were getting overwhelmed by um, just the number of patients we were getting because we just didn't have enough manpower to do it anymore. Um, my co-residents were, were, were burning out. And this is all literally just within a span of a week that you just saw this massive increase of not just the number of people, it was also just the intensity of what we were seeing. Um, and it's, it's, I always try to tell people that most of the things that we were doing were not new. The virus is new, but we were, we were offering breathing support to people, right? So breathing support is not something new. We've done this in medicine for years. We know how to do this. The issue was resources. The issue was that instead of 10 people at a time, now you have 30 or 35 people at a time um, for any one single person. Um, to oversee, for example. So the issue became, I think the predominant issue was resources also, where you just didn't have, we just didn't have enough resources to support those many people all of a sudden. So what we were doing wasn't new. The machines we were, we were using, they weren't new. Right. But it was, our, 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 our thought process was not new. I mean, even though COVID was a new virus and we were seeing many different things, but many of the things we were doing, we always do it anyway. It was just this massive intensity of, of how a typical day started looking like um, with language barrier, um, with the fact that family members are not allowed all of a sudden. Um, so your patients are, you are the only person they can talk to or, or basically are, are relying on in the hospital because you know family members are always there to feed you in the hospital, otherwise to advocate for you. Um, especially old people, especially elderly, when their children come around and, and they feed them and they, and they spend time with them, they automatically get better because, because we are strangers for them, obviously. Um, and now on top of that, you're also wearing masks and you're wearing those hideous goggles and, and you're wrapped up all together. So they can't even see your face. You're there to save their life per se, but, but they're, they're, they're frightened for their lives. They cannot see you. Um, they can't even hear you properly. Because, because with, with the mass, even normal communication became so difficult and so challenging. We had to scream at everybody to make sure they were able to hear us. So even the simple process of holding someone's hand when I know there's nothing else I can do and he's dying in front of me just became so like, I don't know. I mean, I hope it worked, but for me, it was just so heartbreaking that I can't even hold someone's hand and 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 just offer that that moment of um, of solace to someone when I can't see my when I can't when they can't see my face when they can't hear me properly um, their family is not around them um, so um, we're not it's not like it's not that we're not used to deaths doctors and nurses and healthcare staff we we are used to seeing people die in the hospitals because you know that's part of what we do. But but suddenly it wasn't just about deaths. It was about multiple deaths in a row. It was about like I had never seen six deaths in one day, for example. Usually my my frequency, the frequency of deaths is usually, let's say once in two weeks. You know, um, um, some are expected, some are not so expected. I've seen many unexpected deaths as well. Um, but the uh, and, and you do everything possible for them. But the frequency is usually in today's day and age. It's like, I would say once in two weeks. Now you're seeing six deaths in one day um, and uh, in front of you. And that's just one person, right? So, so multiply that with, with what is happening in the entire hospital. And, and every time someone needed um, the um, immediate rapid response for rescue, um, let's say their breathing was getting deteriorated or, or, or whatever, or their heart suddenly stopped. Announcements are made overhead in the entire hospital to alert people and to, and to um, gather help because um, we need people to perform chest compressions and to intubate people and uh, put them on ventilators and, and multiple nurses and respiratory therapists. So announcements are, and that's also common practice when, when a patient crashes in any way announcements are made in the hospital to make sure that the right people get to hear where help is needed and they come right away within five minutes ten minutes and now you're hearing these announcements like 15 times in a day so even if your own patients are not immediately crushing in front of you you can see that 
at one time, literally in one, I remember like within half an hour, I, I heard three announcements just within 30 minutes, which means three people are dying right now um, in 30 minutes, within 30 minutes, a span of 30 minutes. So, um, and most of them didn't survive. Um, for, for the most part, most of them didn't survive. So it was, it was just the magnanimity and just, just, just insane. Like just people just dropping dead like flies. And, and, and for a long time, it, I, I also started questioning um, if I was doing something wrong because, um, and it was, it was comforting to know that everybody else around me in other hospitals or other departments, et cetera, or we're also going through the same thing. But for the most part, as a doctor, that's the guilt you're, you're living with. Um, did I mess something up? Did he or she die because of something I could have done and didn't do? Um, uh, because if it happens once, you can still sort of calm yourself down. But if it's happening five or six times in a row and you, and, and like I said, Pre-COVID, my majority of my patients were like 70 plus. We always we saw younger ones as well, of course. We, we saw younger people too, but by and large, the majority of patients that we deal with are 70 plus, I would say, 65 plus. Now I'm suddenly seeing 40 people in their 40s dying in front of me, 50s dying in front of me, 60s dying in front of me, um, family members screaming on the phone, crying on the phone, um, so every day, part of the job is also to obviously um, call family members and give them daily updates because they cannot, they were not able to visit any longer like they, they were able to before. Um, and many a times those phone calls were just about family members putting me on loudspeaker and just crying out loud together. Um, like they would just literally, like they would just say, can we put you on loudspeaker? And they would just cry. They would just cry. Um, we would have video calls because they wanted to see their loved ones. And then there were times when they couldn't see them till their last breath. So I had to show them um, their face at the end to the family through video cameras. Um, and they can't see me and I can't hold their hands. And it's just, it was just so unsettling, just, just the way everything turned around. And then so many people were dying that like, so first I didn't absorb the, 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 how enormous this was, but then the next day I come at 6am to start my shift and I see that there's a, there's a truck lined up outside my hospital and we're like, okay, what is this for? It turns out our morgue is running out of space for dead bodies. So they had to hire, my hospital had to hire a truck um, that has freezing capabilities to, to keep dead bodies because we ran out of body bags. There were points where I was told that the hospital doesn't have body bags anymore. So we ran out of body bags. We ran out of space to keep the bodies. Um, so that's the first thing you're seeing when you're entering the hospital. There's a, there's a body, there's a truck for dead bodies, um, standing there, parked there outside for you. Um, so it was basically, so it was that. And then for the first time in my life, it was also my fear of dying myself. Oh. Um, in, 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 the, in the normal, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, this was not the first infectious disease we've come across. Um, tuberculosis, for example, that's also, uh, it's an airborne disease. You can, you can catch it. You don't even need droplets for tuberculosis. Um, so I, I used to see TB patients many a times. There are quite a few TB patients in Brooklyn, actually. Mm. Um, so tuberculosis is an infectious disease. HIV is an infectious disease. Hepatitis is an infectious disease. So it's not, it's not like this was the first time we were, we were dealing with patients who, um, with whom there was a possibility that we might also contract the disease from them. Um, it was just that tuberculosis and, and any other infectious disease, there was, there was just this trust in, in the preventive measures that were there in the hospital, that we are taking the right preventive measures to minimize our chance of getting it. And even if, um, even if we end up getting it from them, um, even if I end up getting a disease, if I end up contracting a disease from my patient, I had the trust that I will have access to the right treatment right away, because I know these are um, by and large, treatable, manageable diseases. Now, all of a sudden, when you don't know what's working for coronavirus, 
um, and all you're seeing is um, people dying in front of you, including people your own age, actually. Um, so all of a sudden, um, while there was this emotional turmoil of seeing um, other people dying, there was also this fear of myself getting infected. Um, I, 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 I'm not exaggerating. I used to get morbid imaginations of uh, seeing myself on a ventilator. Mm. Um, and then the fear that I'm bringing that back home to my husband who didn't sign up for this. Um, he was living at home. He was working at home hundred percent. He had absolutely no point of contact other than me. Um, we even, um, we discussed if we should maybe stay away if, because a lot of doctors started doing that, um, especially those who had um, older parents at home or newborns at home. At that time, nobody knew how it's going to affect newborns. And there were so many doctors with newborns, including mothers of newborns, actually. And they decided to stay away from their parents um, um, and away from their newborns. So that was also a conversation my husband and I had if we should just separate for a while, because that's what I was hearing left, right and center. People were, they just, they just, rented another room and just lived there for an indefinite period of time but my husband and i at the end of the day were also of the opinion that we just don't know for how long this is going to last and for us just staying away because of this fear at the same time also did not feel sustainable we um i even i didn't think that i would be able to do i didn't i i was but i didn't want to be guilty either but then he was someone who, you know, he comforted me and he said, you know, this is, I know that other people are doing this, but I don't think we can do this. So I, we didn't separate, but, um, but then I tried basically everything that is possible in, in the power of a human being to disinfect myself as much as I could before I left the hospital um, and just come home and, and just, there was a whole protocol that I followed for, I think, 40, 50 days um, at a stretch where I tried to disinfect myself as much as I could um, and then be available to see him. Um, so, yeah, so it was, it was that plus the fear of yourself getting infected and then being a source of infecting someone else. Um, by and large, most people who get infected, it's true that most of us will get mild symptoms. The issue was that at that point, working in the working at working in a hospital that was really the hub of this pandemic, um, all I was seeing, I was not seeing the 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 people with lighter symptoms. That's so I had a I had a mm -hmm. bias in my vision because because those who had light symptoms, they weren't coming to the hospital. They were managing it at home. At the hospital, the, the hundreds of patients I saw were all those who just couldn't handle it at home, eventually ended up at the emergency and had to be admitted because they could not be sent back home. And by that time, most of them were in a position where they would, they would either die right away or, or die weeks to months later. So, so the, yeah. I know it was a bias because I was, that's all I was seeing, but, uh, and I didn't see the ones who were doing relatively okay or were um, able to control it at home. Um, all I was seeing every day was people dying in front of me, left, right, and center. Um, constantly questioning if this was something I was going wrong with. Um, is there something else we can do for them? Um, am I responsible any, in any way for so many deaths? Is there something that I can do? Because it was that guilt was part of the process, and some very difficult decisions to make as well. Um, uh, for example, when um, when when people's breathing would become when the breathing would become so bad that it started putting pressure on the heart, mm -hmm. um, the heart at at a point just stops beating because it's just not able to um, take that pressure on the breathing, basically, in, 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 um, in simple terms, for example. So people were, um, uh, they were getting cardiac arrest left, right, and center. And those were most, and, and they were getting cardiac arrest, not because there was anything wrong with the heart, but mostly because of the respiratory oh. burden, their heart would just stop working because there was just so much burden of, um, of breathing on them. 
so there were multiple um, calls for what we call um, uh, code three or code or CPR, basically chest compressions to um, chest compressions that are meticulously done um, to try and see if we can revive the heart, if we can fix the problem, if maybe if we can put attach them to a ventilator, improve their breathing, maybe the heart would revive. So, and, and that's a very key procedure um, that works many a times and we're used to doing it all the time. But the problem with, a big problem with running codes, and as a senior resident physician, I often use, I, I was often the code leader and code leader is the person who basically um, steps back and takes charge of the entire process. Okay. Um, like there's something going on right now. There's an emergency. We need to deal with it. Um, and I used to be the code leader giving directions to other people about what to do um, in that moment. So it's a very emotionally um, charged moment that you have to deal with. So as a code leader, my, I think my biggest challenge in those multiple codes that I, that I led um, in that period one big challenge that was that would always make me feel guilty was that um, when you're performing those chest compressions, um, mm -hmm. uh, you are also, for someone who has the virus in his or her lungs, performing chest compressions basically means that you are amplifying the aerosolization of the virus because you're pressing it, right. you're pressing the chest, right? So the virus can come out of your, um, it can aerosolize through your mouth, through your nose. Mm -hmm. Um, so the biggest challenge was, um, this is someone who needs this. Um, should I, cause normally we run these quotes for 35, 40 minutes. I've even run quotes for an hour. If it doesn't work, sometimes if we feel we can still do something, we don't give up. We, we continuously do it for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I've run quotes for as long as an hour even. Mm -hmm. But here the issue was that as a court leader, I'm asking young resident physicians, young doctors to perform these chest compressions and increasing their exposure to this virus by multiple folds because while they're doing this to save that person, to try and save that person, they're also getting exposed to this virus during the process. Not just them, everybody in the room mm -hmm. is getting exposed massively. It's nothing compared to the exposure you will get on the street, you are actually initiating aerosolization of the virus and you're standing in front of them. Your nose is right there. You're breathing that even if the mask is on. Um, so as a court leader, the biggest challenge would be to, was to drive that balance between trying to save this person who's already sick, but also not at the expense of those young doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and other healthcare workers in the room young healthy people who are trying to do that should we do this or should i save these people um, uh, can i afford to do this for an hour like i used to before if it's a if if a 40 year old 45 year old man codes otherwise and i feel there is something that can be fixed i would run that code for an hour mm -hmm. because i will give him that chance for as long as I possibly feel is, is, um, is uh, reasonable. Um, beyond, beyond certain reasons, if I feel there's no chance, we stop those codes and we say, no, even if this, someone's 35, we know this is not going to work. So we just make that medical decision. But if I feel something can be, can be fixed, we do it for as long as we possibly can. But here, we, I had to stop it after 15 minutes at times because, because, my thought process was that this virus is so lethal. If he, if his heart has stopped at this point, the chances of reviving him are very minimal, to be honest. And, and in the effort of doing that, I am exposing five, um, and five healthy doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists in the room. So, so when you stop that after 15 minutes, your conscience also starts questioning you what if he would have revived if I did it for five more minutes? Right. So like, how do you mark that line? How do you, um, how do you say how much is enough for him and how much is, like, how do you strike that balance between saving this person and protecting five other people who are still alive and, and, and there to help you? So it's a very different, um, 
So I think in, in a setting of a public health emergency, it's a very different mindset. I was reading that um, your, your sense of ethics has to change in a public health crisis, because in a public health crisis, your, your focus inevitably becomes saving the maximum number of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it was like an unannounced sort of thing where we, and it was, this happened unanimously everywhere that we didn't quote them for as long as we would have done if virus was not a problem. Right. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the impact that has on your conscience as a, as a, as a physician, um, the guilt that you carry with it outside, but you also know that you did it um, to prevent other people from dying like this. So, so I think that was a very challenging decision that I had to take. Um, it was just, I could go on and on. Like it's... Hmm. Um, um, it was very weighted. Very heavy. It was just very, very heavy. And um, that's all I saw for weeks on end. That's all I saw. That's all I did. Um, and that's why I just wore scrubs for three months, like I said, because nothing else mattered. In both, in, like nothing else mattered. I was just... Um, and I would, al I would always question, what is it that makes me get up every morning and, and still push myself to go. Like, why am I still doing this? What's, what's the, why am I doing this? Um, if I know um, I can get it like other people have, if I know I can die like other people have. Um, uh, it's true that most people were, you know, uh, they were elderly, comorbidities, whatever, but I didn't stop seeing people who were my age. I saw people who were my age. Um, and some of them were really, really sick. So even though I know the chances are very low, for those people who were my age and on ventilators for weeks on end, for that person, it was a 100% thing. So I could have been that person too. Like, I know like this was against statistics, but the fear was rational, I think, because it was just... Um, you're still seeing that. You're still seeing that. And also, um, the exposure of healthcare workers was also just enormous because... So many of the um, procedures or symptoms that we were encountering directly aerosolized the virus. So our exposure was several times higher than, than um, my exposure um, uh, if I'm walking on the street. Um, it's true that they had these like conflicting studies where they felt that um, the, the percentage um, of getting it while at work is the same as um, getting it out in the community. There are a few conflicting studies that, that also say that. But in that moment, when I know that I am, I am in front of people who are coughing, who, are, um, um, who need chest compressions, um, who just got intubated, even when you put a, the tube down in the throat to attack someone on the ventilator, that's a very heavily aerosolizing um, procedure. Um, then we were using these very strong nasal cannulas to improve oxygenation. Those nasal cannulas were also aerosolizing it everywhere. So the, the just that fear of, of being surrounded by that exposure for 12 hours at a stretch, it, the, the shifts were 12 hours long, right? So not even 12, at times they were 14, 15 hours even. Mm. Um, the minimum 12 hours. Uh, yeah, so it was just... It was just an amalgamation of everything. Um, but some good things also happened, if I really reflect on, because that's how you rationalize things and that's how you survive and that's how you... Right. Um, and that's how you uh, move on and that's how you um, make sense of it all. Some good things also happened. And um, one really good thing that I felt through this crisis in the hospital. And this happened in every hospital of New York. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a combined um, Effort. experience was that um, because medicine doctors were no more, the number was no more sufficient to take care of the um, number of patients, um, all the other specialties were requested to completely halt whatever they were doing um, because nothing else was happening, right? No surgery was happening. Um, uh, predominantly like all the elective procedures um, um, 
they were just not happening. So they were all recruited to take care of these patients, um, something they had never done for years. Um, so for the first time, surgeons are taking care of pneumonias, um, something that they were not, um, that they hadn't done for years, basically. Mm -hmm. So the way, the way my hospital tackled with it was that they um, employed someone from medicine in each of these areas where um, the medicine doctor would supervise um, the psychiatrists or the pediatricians or the gynecologists or um, the surgeons. They would supervise and then they would do it under that supervision. So I think in this way, because um, otherwise, um, you, 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 otherwise in, in, a, in a hospital environment, you can expect a lot of silos between specialties because specialties work independently. Through this crisis, the entire hospital came together. Um, and, when I, and, and when I said this happened everywhere, we're talking about the same unity observed in multiple different hospitals of New York in, in the peak of this crisis. For a whole month or maybe, I think four to six weeks, the entire hospital shut everything else and everybody was just taking care of patients with COVID-19. Um, so the specialties came together, the doctors, the nurses came together. Um, so I thought that that was very beautiful, that everybody was doing, um, was, was just working for one cause. United and, effort. Yeah. And they did not care about whatever they were working. So I'm especially thankful to those specialties actually, because um, even though we never signed up to, to deal with COVID, COVID was at least, it was our specialty. Like COVID is what comes to medicine. It comes to infectious diseases. It comes to emergency medicine. So nobody signed up for it, but at least, you know, um, we were there because it was our, it was our, it's, it's under our domain, but surgeons don't deal with that. Gynecologists don't deal with that. Psychiatrists, and they haven't done this for years, but they were still doing it. So I thought that was extremely beautiful. The other thing um, that I really, really appreciate was that um, for, for the first two, three weeks, we were short on staff. So, so short on all kinds of, especially nursing staff. Um, so that was a nightmare, but, but with time, you know, it was, it was a new thing for everybody. So even, even hospitals were not prepared for this, right? So, um, so it took them a while to figure out how to increase staffing. And then lo and behold, all of a sudden we had like these 400, 500 new nurses from all over the United States who, um, and I spoke to many of them, nobody really asked them to come and help in New York. It's not like they were sent by their hospitals, they volunteered. Um, they, were, they were telling me that they were feeling so guilty because um, during that crisis, um, um, many of the hospitals started elsewhere in other states, they started facing, um, like patients just stopped coming, right? Because of the fear of catching the virus. Um, so the nurses thought that they, they're, their workload had suddenly decreased and they were feeling guilty that they weren't doing much work anymore. Um, and their, and their colleagues in New York are just hammered. Going crazy, are getting hammered. So they were actually feeling very guilty and they, they volunteered, they signed up for organizations that were hiring travel nurses and they came here to do this. And I thought that was, that was just beautiful because because all of a sudden i'm working in a unit i've never worked before because like i'm saying right um medicine has specific units so we were just used to our specific floors our specific departments now suddenly i'm working on a new floor i had never worked on the third floor for example now suddenly i'm working on the third floor suddenly i'm working on the fourth floor so i'm not used to the um the the physical aspects of where i'm working number one uh, and I can't see anybody's faces because we're all masked up, gowned up. You can't even see people's eyes. Everybody's wearing goggles. Um, and now suddenly you also know that they are all from elsewhere. Uh, like I, I once went around asking and they were like, like got every single state was there. So I thought that was just so beautiful that they were all here for a single cause. Um, you can you couldn't see their faces. You couldn't, you couldn't talk to them properly, but you knew there was a connection because they were all doing the same thing. They were all here for the same purpose. Um, so I think that, um, was just beautiful. I got to talk to so many people from different States. Um, uh, and just, yeah, I'm, I'm forever grateful to those people. Um, and they were, um, taking care of everybody's food, everybody's, uh, 
did you drink enough? Do you want coffee? There were coffee rounds. So, you know, like by the third week, fourth week, we started seeing those things as well, um, where we were going through some very difficult times, but the, um, but the unity is something that I think it, it sort of kept me, kept me strong that I'm not alone in this, we're not alone in this, and we're all doing something for the same purpose. So, yeah. Um, you got to see the word human, uh, unity, U-N-I-T-Y, in the word humanity. In, absolutely, in front of me, and it was just unbelievable. It was unbelievable, because, um, and you could, see, you could sense that uh, their accents are different, so even though you can't see their faces, you can tell this nurse is not from New York. Yeah. You can tell. You can tell. Around here. You can tell by personality, accent. You know that everybody knows they're different. Their differences from state to state. I couldn't tell which state. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not yet um, uh, expert enough to determine that. But I knew this nurse is not from New York. Uh, and then I would go up to her and say, "Hey, are you visiting us? Are you here from somewhere else?" And then she would go on and oh, "Yes, I'm from South Dakota. I'm from North Carolina." So oh, my goodness. And people from Maine, California, like all the way from the West Coast were here. It wasn't even just nearby states. And they said, of course, we were feeling so guilty. And then I asked them, hey, did you guys like, you know, like, uh, did your hospital send you here? They said, no, we were feeling so guilty. We signed up ourselves. That was the unanimous answer of all of them. It was amazing. Like they didn't care about their, they didn't care about their life. They were also going back to older parents when, whenever they were going back. Oh, yeah. and, and for those four to six weeks, they were living in like, um, you know, random housing because ho- housing and everything was completely a complete mess during that time. So th- I don't know how they were eating. I don't know how they were sleeping. I don't know where they were living. I mean, they had, um, I'm sure they had those, but it's not easy. Even if someone offers you a room to live in for six weeks, it's not easy to do that. Um, yeah. And um, it wasn't all, it wasn't all floral either. They broke down too. I saw nurses breaking, I saw them breaking down in front of me um, because just, it was just so much to take at any given time that I don't think I can even do justice talking about it. Um, um, So I saw people breaking down. I saw people looking out, but I also saw people looking out for each other. Um, And like one nurse saw that in initially because I was wearing the mask um, continuously for several hours at a stretch, 12, 14 hours every day. Um, the mask has a wire here that goes up your nose and that's part of the good seal that it provides. So when you do that for 14 hours at a stretch, um, a week in a row, basically, um, it started creating this pressure also on my nose that I wasn't really paying heed to in the beginning. I didn't really... Um, think about cushioning or anything I would just wear it and I would just forget about it but then I would take it off and I would notice that it started to like my skin was peeling there was an ulcer forming here um, and one of those nurses saw that and she right away she went somewhere to some utility room in some on some other floor and she got this thing from me and then she made me sit down and she said no take your mask off and then she created the whole thing and then, then she was a travel nurse, right? So everybody was looking, she saw that my nose was hurting and my nose was red and she went there and she got something and then she made me sit down and she, I still have a picture of that moment, it was beautiful. And I didn't be like, oh, what are you doing? She didn't wanna sit here. And then she fixed the whole thing then she fixed the mask for me. Um, so yeah, everybody was looking out for each other because we were all going through the same things and they all had, one nurse told me um, that she lost her father from COVID-19 four days ago in Jamaica, and she couldn't go there. Um, oh. she, she couldn't get her, go there to see him. And I am amazed that, that this was her way of dealing with her grief, um, that she decided to, she was a travel nurse from another state, and she decided to come to our hospital to take care of patients with COVID-19 four days after her own father died in another country. And she wouldn't go there to see him. So yeah, you know, these just these stories of resilience, strength, uh, the things people were doing, the kind of the, the the ways, basically everybody going out of their way for their patients, for themselves, for colleagues, for family members, the sacrifices, the compromises they were making. Um, as much as I don't ever want to live those days again, I also know that because I've lived through them. It has really, um, um, it teaches you a lot. 
um, now that I've survived it, it teaches you a lot. It teaches you just, just things that I will always, I will never forget for years to come actually, for generations to come. So it's like you took a master class, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Master class. And also just, um, speaking of master class, a lot of things that we had to start doing was also, um, like most of our patients needed the ICU, uh, because, uh, ICU is a separate, um, it's a separate entity of, of different kind of care that patients are given. It's called critical care for a reason where the ratio of patient to nurses is different. Resources are different. So whoever needs ICU level of care, um, is always moved to the critical care unit because we know that they will get the kind of care that other units in the hospital are not designed to provide. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, so typically now all of a sudden, like our medical ICU has 20 beds, for example, and all ICUs come. What I'm trying to say is that all of a sudden, even though they converted every single ICU, including the pediatric ICU, the children's ICU was also converted into COVID ICU despite converting every single ICU in the hospital and doubling the capacity of each ICU also. Despite doing that, we were still getting so many patients who we knew needed ICU level of care, but there was no bed in the ICU anymore. So we, we started having like this whole waiting line of patients, um, number 16, number 17 on the ICU waiting list, where you know this patient needs the ICU, but the ICU is full. There's how do you, they double their bed, they, they maximize the entire space, they did everything possible, converted, opened up a new ICU overnight, but there's only so much you can do. So um, I, I, I'm connecting this to what you just said about overnight, learning things overnight. So now I was in a position where um, I had to run an ICU on a normal floor because there's just no space in an ICU. I know he needs ICU level of care, uh, but now I cannot send him there. Uh, there's no space. What do you do? Then you, so it was, it's a, so sometimes we joke that we got an overnight ICU training, something that I had never signed up for. <laughs> uh, we got an overnight ICU training because we started taking care of those critical needs um, on floors um, that were not designed to provide those things. So we learned to, even medically, clinically, we, we picked up a lot of things that we um, wouldn't have done because that's not part of our, that's not what my medical training was supposed to provide. Um, but we, yes, it was just overnight, like just so many decisions that I was not, I was not used to making, but you pick up, you pick up, you gather the strength. I mean, you, you, you know how to learn, you know how to make decisions, you know what factors to um, and then we had massive amount of help from everywhere in the hospital as well. So, um, um, so yeah, it was overnight everything. Like, mm -hmm. you, we got everything overnight, basically. Just the instant. Um, instant. It was, um, it's yeah. Kind of, it's a cool feature that it's sort of like if a building broke down and then people around the country came together to rebuild the building they're like we're gonna do this we're just showing up i'm here from different yeah, areas and yeah, let's do yeah, this yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the area amazing it was amazing that the when we hired new nurses i thought that was just beautiful like in the it was it was something that i don't think i'll ever see again hopefully touch wood but it was whatever i saw it was also yeah i want to focus on the silver linings as well and that truly was that truly was one thing that comes to mind is that's a key moment in life. We only have certain key moments. What would you say are some of the biggest, let's say today, the same shock that happened then occurred today. It couldn't really happen, I guess, the same way now, but uh, what, what different position are hospitals in today than they were in three months ago in relation to that virus? Like, let's say today just ramped up shockingly. What kind of preparation would be there? Honestly, I'm not sure if, if hospitals are ready for us second wave oh. like i'm not sure um they will definitely be better ready than they were before now mm -hmm. we know where to get um first of all now we have more research yeah more information about this virus than we had before that mm -hmm. now we have better protocols that means that that makes a world of a difference um now we have better protocols about what to do 
um, what to take care of, what medications work, what didn't work. For example, in the beginning, we were giving hydroxychloroquine, right? Um, because we didn't have enough. Um, it, was, it was thought that it would work, so we were trying whatever we thought would work. But now we know it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So it, we fairly know that it doesn't work. So, um, so there have been some shifts in, um, even though we're still not sure about many things, um, we still don't have um, an answer to how to treat this accurately. We still have a f reasonable idea about how to go about it, um, at least better than where we were before. So the medical, the clinical protocols, those were more, were slightly more confident than we were before, for example. Um, and then I guess in terms of resources, now um, we know how to get ventilators. We know how to get, um, I'm sure, I, I don't know what happened to the extra ventilators that my hospital um, hired during the crisis. I'm sure they've kept them. I don't know what, the, I'm not exactly sure, but I'm pretty sure they know how to access them again mm -hmm. um, if something along those lines happens again. Um, so in terms of resources, um, even though uh, I'm not exactly sure um, what plans they have, um, I'm pretty sure they have a sense of where to go to obtain what, because um, we we figured what we needed more, um, we figured how to hire more staff, we figured how to get more protective equipment for our um, healthcare workers. Um, we figured how to um, how to manage family members and their grief and, and their concerns. Um, so it'll be more streamlined, uh, definitely, if God forbid, if this has to occur again. Um, but, oh my God, I don't want that to happen. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we have a fair idea at least, um, and we have some more confidence in protocols as well. Mm. Um, but there's still so much. The truth is that there's still so much unknown, especially about um, the complications of this virus, the complications of the immune system, and, um, and what arsenal do we have against it? There's still so much unknown and still so much is being studied. Um, that we will still be in many, um, uh, we will still have to be in situations that we would feel ambiguous about, but, but, but yeah, I, we have a better sense of what to try, what to not try, what to give, what to not give, where to get it from. Because like simple things like, you know, like we knew some medications work, but those medications were not um, sufficiently available in the market. So even though, I wanted to try something. I just couldn't get it for my patients. I didn't have an answer to the, for the family members when they would ask me. What about that? I said, I know I, I would have tried it if I had it. I can't get it. So that's like those were challenges we met in the first week or 10 days. But then slowly we figured that the productions, the, the supply market started changing. We started getting those medications. Um, um, then first some medications were just part of some um, protocols um, for clinical trials. Now those medications are more readily available um, even outside um, those clinical trials. Like even if you're not enrolled in those clinical trials, you can still get some medications like that. But things have changed. Things have changed. You have more options. Um, and you just, yeah, are just better versed, well versed in how to manage it. But there's still so much unknown that, um, yeah, I don't feel conf I mean, I'll do it if I have to, but I still don't feel confident about it mm -hmm. uh, because we st there's still a long, long way to go. And like any other um, um, epidemic never seen before, it, it's, the, the timeline is pretty much the same. It goes on for years until right. you really figure out what happens because people like, um, the doctors from the older generations, they keep giving me the example of HIV. When HIV was first sure. discovered, um, this was just 40, 50 years ago, right? And they, they saw that. They saw the HIV epidemic. Nobody knew anything about it because HIV is also a crazy virus. It's a crazy, crazy virus. Um, the only 
um, good thing about HIV is that it's not so readily spread through um, through respiratory droplets. Um, so that was the only good thing um, to be able to contain, but HIV can cause so many crazy things in your body. When it was first discovered, nobody knew anything about it. Um, and people, and, and, and they're, they were recalling actually, many of my um, older physicians were recalling how they saw young men were um, um, somehow more affected, they were saying, and just dying left, right, and center. And, and, and HIV was predominantly affecting young people, right? So mm -hmm. um, young people dying left, right, and center. So, but now we have um, HIV is treatable. It's no more a stigma. Um, you can have HIV and you can not infect anybody else. Um, so there is just so much known about it. So it's not the first time that this world is seeing right. um, an outbreak. It's not the first time. We've seen similar outbreaks multiple times. We fight through them. We see deaths. Bad things happen. And those who survive learn more, study more, research more. And then you you come up with solutions. So we're just part of that initial phase where we're it's chaos. Everybody's confused. One day you hear one thing, the other day you hear another thing. Even doctors are confused, honestly. Um, one day something, you think something works, the other day you figure out, no, it doesn't work, what to try, what not to try, wear a mask, not wear a mask. Um, is, it, is, is it droplet? Is it airborne? There's still so many conflicting answers, to be honest. Um, but we are... Um, uh, there are lots of studies that have taken place. We have a fair idea about community transmission, asymptomatic transmission. Um, we have a fair idea about attack rate in family members if one person gets it. Uh, because that was also very interesting. I always like, um, and now we know that this is exactly what attack rate is, um, that one person would get infected and within the same household, among people living closely, not everybody would get positive. Um, and even those who did, not everybody mounted the same symptoms. So how is that possible? They're all five people living in the same apartment, all um, exposed to that person who got it from somewhere. Mm -hmm. but, they, but not all five got it. And those who got it did not mount the same symptoms that this person did. So it's, it's fascinating. Like, why does that happen? Even right. though we're living in the, same, in the same proximity, why did that happen? Um, so yeah, so we know that that's exactly how um, it's probability. This is what statistics are. That um, it's it's perfectly expected that this uh, that all the family members will not get infected, for example. So yeah, so we are definitely better prepared, but it's still we still have so much unknown that um, to this day prevention is the key. When, when there's so much unknown, um, prevention is really what we should be focusing on. Um, that makes sense. But again, at the same time, I was just reading another um, perspective where we know prevention is the key and everybody knows that, but even then, not everybody will wear a mask. And a mask is like a simple thing, right? It's like a simple mask, you put it on, um, surgical masks usually are breathable. So why is it that um, people will still not wear it? Um, and I was reading that rather than shaming them, and it was a very good perspective, rather than, because um, you can't solve these public health issues by shaming people who choose not to do what you think should be done. Um, uh, because if you shame them, you're just alienating them even more. Um, rather than shaming them, just getting down to where they are and understanding why they're not wearing it. Um, also knowing that human beings are not perfect and, and no matter how much you talk about uh, the severity of this crisis um, and no matter how much they know it and they've heard about it, everybody knows the number of deaths in the United States. Um, it's pretty fascinating that even then they won't wear it. Um, so it's, so I think at the end of the day, the, the conclusion really is that as long as most people wear it, um, we will still be able to contain it in a manner that doesn't overwhelm our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, 
because we know that's exactly what this is human psychology we can see it all around everybody knows the number of deaths in the united states um it's nothing new but they would still not wear it so as long as i think most of us are wearing it um and not shaming those who are not wearing it uh because shaming will not serve any purpose they're not going to wear it because if you shame them um it's it's not the solution it never was it's never been um mm-hmm. because people were recalling the hiv epidemic also and they were recalling that shaming people for not wearing condoms also never worked it mm-hmm. never worked um right if if anything worked actually um it was pretty interesting that if anything they felt worked was for example um uh was increasing the availability of condoms um in fact something very interesting i read that um increasing the availability of condoms um at bars actually um that sort of so so similarly if you were to uh, make mass more available outside grocery stores um and freely these should be free right um outside bus stops outside subway stations lowering um, the friction just lower in the friction rather than shaming them mm-hmm. because shaming has never worked um and as much as as because you may think this is something so simple but that's exactly what human beings are complicated you may think this is simple and it may be simple but that person doesn't think it's simple and they still don't want to do it um they could have a million arguments against it um despite knowing how many people have died in the united states um so yeah just trying to strike that common balance and common ground and and reaching a point where we are able to um just it's never going to be zero it's coronavirus is here to stay at least till we have a vaccine for it so at least till then um just controlling it enough so that the healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed by it um and then by that time also giving some more time to um figuring out what medications work what tips and tricks work um what vaccines work etc so yeah you just yeah. made me i have a friend felipe he's a phys- physician's assistant and he treats hiv patients he's done mm-hmm. it for about 15 years and so a few of the things you just mentioned are true like his category of work is kind of put on the back burner for the time being because obviously there's a bigger focus on other also that was the previous or a past epidemic of sorts and so that's shown a way that it starts out it's a shock factor you don't shame people you work ways to manage the system and then it you progresses mean, over time as much as that's your natural instinct sometimes frankly it's it's also my instinct because i'm like it's so simple why are you not wearing it but it's easier to do that and and more challenging to just understand that that's how humans work and you can never get 100% of the people to do something as simple as wearing a mask that is worth a few cents mm mm-hmm. it's just not it's just you can see it it just doesn't work um so meeting them where they are um as someone wrote it very beautifully is i think the way to go to just make it more available just yeah make it more available where it matters so grocery stores you're not you're not shutting them down right so um so they're a big hub for people to gather so make them available outside grocery stores make them available outside bus stops make them available outside subway stations make them available in public areas um i was i was quite happy to see that even in these protests um there were free masks available for everybody so it was a good thing right uh, people wanted to protest um and you couldn't stop them from protesting um uh, in the name of a new pandemic um when they were talking about a pandemic that's been going on for years so they had their own argument right they were um, they were worried about the the other pandemic that's been going on unchecked for years so nobody could stop them from coming out and protest but i could see that um people were distributing free masks um so yes i guess just um focusing on those things um and yeah just just, just learning to live with it for for some time i guess mary from scotland who you had met previously just today 
for a variety of her family and friends had made a bunch of masks of different styles and whatnot. Oh, kind of yeah. <laughs> I got a few. I got a few matching masks as well that go with my outfits because I'm like, it's wearing the surgical mask is so boring. Yeah. I have to make this more sustainable, more fun. Uh-huh. Um, so even for myself, I got like a few masks that go with like different friends that would just go with different outfits of mine because I'm like, okay, you know, I know this has to stay. This is here to stay. This is not going anywhere might as well make it more sustainable, something that I might just look forward to. Yeah. Who knows, this could become the new fashion statement. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, I'm all for um, different masks with different designs that go with different, <laughs> I, I'm all for them, yeah. Um, because anything that makes people want to wear them, yeah, rather than shaming them for not wearing them. Mm-hmm. Is I think really the way to go because you can shaming will not will not work. It will never work. It never has. It never will. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing that came to mind also: what are the biggest shifts in you from three months ago to now, or growths, or different life perspective? Is there any change you can see right now? Sometimes it's not as clear when it's just happened, but mm-hmm. do you see any things where, like, if you met the you from three months ago, you'd say? Here's a couple of things you'll pick up on. It might be too soon for that. No, it's, I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm still processing it. I'm still mm-hmm. processing what it means for me um, at present time, what it means for me, for my future, what it means to, um, like, how, how has it really impacted me? Um, for one, it's just something that, it's corny, but it's just that, but it's also true. Um, it's, it's just the beauty of human compassion. It's a very corny. It's not corny. Answer. It's super cool on this show. This is not creative at all. Um, but it's just this value of human compassion. It's just this, because what I noticed from time to time was that even though I could not save their family member, um, all I got from family members was gratitude. That was because they knew I couldn't save them, but through my phone calls, through my updates, through different ways of helping them, um, they knew that I was trying my best. And they knew that I was trying my best while risking my own life, right? So, so, and which I was, that's exactly what I was doing. I was trying my level best, whatever was possible in my powers. And, the, and sometimes I was shocked that they're not getting angry. They're not getting frustrated. Um, all they had to say was, thank you. Um, even though they were there to collect the dead body, all they had to say was thank you. And I thought that was that was remarkable because this is this is the value of human compassion. It sort of fades down the negativity. Like they were, I don't. It 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 will never replace what they've lost, but they but they were left with the realization that there was someone who cared for their loved one in an environment where they were not allowed to be there in, in, in um, be there, be present in the same room. They knew there was someone who was advocating for their family members. They knew there was someone who was um, taking care of their needs. Um, like sometimes I would ask them for their loved one's favorite music. So even though they were on a ventilator, you know, I would play them on the side. Who knows whether or not they listen, but I said, I don't know, something, whatever, maybe something works. Or or taking care of their different um, requests. Someone wanted to do something, someone wanted to do something. They wanted me to go and, you know, perform some religious ritual. Even if that ritual was not from the religion I come from, I did it. I said, yeah, you know, whatever works for them, whatever makes them feel better, whatever. So I just felt that if nothing worked, I hope, and I got the feeling that it did, the compassion worked. And it's something, I think it's something extremely under-acknowledged. Um, nobody writes papers on them. Nobody performs clinical trials on them. But if you talk about what I thought worked, 
that worked. Um, I couldn't save them. They died horrible deaths, um, but it left their family members with the realization that they died, but they died at the hands of some of people who truly cared for them. Um, and that is something that just keeps me going. And it's just something that I don't ever want to stop doing or being or thinking like that is my like single most um, like guiding path, anything that is, um, yeah. So it's, it's compassion. Um, I'm definitely much stronger than I was. I've always been very strong and level headed. We all know this over here. Just don't want to point that out. I, I know that I've always been very strong. I know that I'm very, um, like it's, I'll, I know it's, I'll say it. I am, I'm, I am strong. Like you're strong, everybody. Uh, <laughs> but, but this was like some crazy level of strength right. that I had to achieve to get through it. And, um, yeah. I was almost surprised that I, I dealt with it well. I was, I was actually surprised that I dealt with it well. Um, I, uh, so, I mean, credit where credit is due. Um, I do think that I did, um, in terms of my strength, my, my, my resolve, knowing why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and how to just, um, yeah. But when I had to, when I had to vent, because that's another thing that I've learned. Um, I know I'm strong, but I'm not strong every day. I'm not strong every moment. I've cried a number of times. I've vented. I've, I've used many people as my outlet. I've spoken to my therapist a number of times. Um, there are different things. I've, I've written about it um, in my own personal diary, for example. So when I needed to vent, when I needed to cry, um, I also did that. So just the realization that you're not invincible. It's just because, I mean, healthcare heroes also cry. Um, healthcare heroes are also afraid of their own lives. They're also afraid of their family's lives. Um, they break down. They feel helpless. They feel powerless. And I went through all those emotions. So, um, so while I do think I dealt with it very strongly, I had my moments and I didn't guard those moments. So I think that's, that's something that, because um, too often I come across people who, um, or at least that's a perception I get, I don't know, just like, just guarding their weaknesses. Um, I understand that not everybody is, you know, um, uh, not everybody feels comfortable in every environment, but if you're going through something as difficult as this, um, while already being enrolled in a program as challenging and, and difficult as uh, medical training and residency, it's, it's already something that, that just grates you in completely. And then on top of that, you have this whole three months, two, three months of this, this crisis, squeezing the last drop of blood that you have left. Um, you can't pretend that it's not affecting you. So if it's, if it's something affecting you, I, what, I, what I stand for is that I'm going to speak about it. Um, even if those around me um, are not speaking about it as much as I would have liked to, for example, mm -hmm. I will speak about it because, um, because there will always be someone who, who will hear you and, um, and feel that he or she isn't alone. So I don't stop talking about it. I don't stop talking about the physical or mental turmoil it had on me, the emotional turmoil it had, it had on me. I don't stop acknowledging that I'm still dealing with it, that I will um, still be demonstrating some signs of not being able, not having processed what I went through. So it's gonna be a long journey for me to really make sense of exactly what happened. Um, so, so yeah, so just, knowing that I'm strong, but also knowing that um, the future me, like you asked about the future me, right? The future me will not stop, will not be silent about anything she feels uncomfortable about. Um, even if, because for far too often you don't do that because you feel like those around you are not doing that also. So 
um, you know, it sort of deters you, but then no. No. I like that. But if it makes you uncomfortable, know that you're not going to be alone. So if nothing works, there will be someone who will be there to, um, to who hears you and feels he or she's not alone. So you have to talk about what you're going through. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's uh, definitely something that the future me will reflect on based on, um, yeah, so compassion, recognizing that I'm strong, but also recognizing that I have these weaknesses um and maybe you know i will say something or do something or feel something um that is a reflection of what i went through um because i'm still processing it right it takes years for people to even make sense of what they just went through one single event like of a few seconds can sometimes give you trauma for life this was like this was like boluses of trauma every single day <laughs> for weeks right um so it's um yeah so it's a package. It's a yeah. So and it's and it's just going to take as long to 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 heal. So yeah. So. One, that makes sense. Yeah. One thing that comes to mind, I would like to bring this up because it's key. You mentioned invincibility. We're not invincible, right? We have this short time on Earth. I always like to point this out to people. We have a little little blip on Earth, and then off we go. So why are we not doing our thing? Yeah. We have to do our thing. It's almost like I, I see people not doing their thing and it's like they passed away before they even passed away. Like, what are we, what's Absolutely. the point? Absolutely. I am most afraid, exactly. I am always afraid of dying before dying. Like, you stop living before you actually stop living. Um, <laughs> and that's, uh, yeah. And the other thing that, um, um, I know it sounds morbid, but... Uh, nope. The, yep, okay, good. Because the other thing that I really realized, um, we were in the middle of an epidemic. I know it's not a true reflection of life in general because we were in some unusual circumstances. But as a physician, there's something that I really want to advocate for and I will always do that is acknowledge your mortality, whether it's COVID or a traffic accident or some lethal disease or whatever acknowledge your mortality and it's it's a very heavy morbid topic but um most of us should have a like it's sure i'm too young about i'm too young for thinking of, about this but like we should have some sort of like everybody should have advanced directives if not us we should we should have we should definitely speak to our family members about it um our grandparents about it um, advanced directives are basically just, um, or a living will or, or something where you, where you imagine those times when that time hasn't really occurred and you are in a position to think about it, um, and make those crucial decisions about how you want your, how you would want your life to end if something like that were to happen. Um, because I think the, there's a, there's one big thing that, you know, that lacks in society at large, whether it's, um, this country or any other country is that, um, they, we, we don't like talking about death. We don't like talking about mortality and, um, and mortality is basically, there's nothing more true than mortality. Yeah. So we run away from talking about these things, right? Because it's, it's nobody wants to talk about it. Um, and we run away till the end. And we run away thinking it's too soon until it's too late. So, um, and, I'm, and granted my, my vision is coming from a very biased scope of working in an environment where most people who come to see me are are, are in that in our in a scenario where you know are in those unusual circumstances where they're battling with different diseases or or end of life issues i'm sure i understand if somebody thinks my vision is very very narrow here because i'm because i'm because i mostly see people um who are like that but but i i see enough to just just want to make conversations about mortality normal and, and just prepare for things um, in a 
because far too often I see people who are are literally asked about like end of life topics when they're not ready to talk about it and it's like and and things are going downhill in that moment so that's not that's not the time to think about those things um don't do it when you're calm the time is when you're calm the time is when you're home the time is when you're surrounded by family members where you can have one discussion after another after another after another and have a better sense of how you envision your end of life so this is nobody talks about it but um and and even though the epidemic is something unusual and it doesn't happen every day you know you die people die and it's something that um needs to be talked about more often it's something that needs to be um thought about we have to prepare for um those possibilities um including wills and advance directives that also guide doctors and the hospital to do things as you would have liked in a situation um where you are no more able to make those decisions yourself um so we always feel it's too early until it's too late and um again not shaming anybody um i haven't i don't have advance directives per se myself but it's just something that the conversation should 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 be normalized um why do we fear it when there's nothing as true as as death is so that's yeah clear. so that's also like a big take away that you feel like you know like this epidemic right like i saw 45 year olds dying in front of me had they thought about this no they hadn't but it happened um it happened and i and we made decisions when they were not able to make their decisions and i had no idea what he or she would have wanted if they were able to make that decision at that time i only reflected what the families wanted right because i didn't know what they wanted and the families didn't families families basically they just they try their best to um knowing that person best they try their best to make decisions that are in line with someone's view vision principles about how they want things to be um what they would have wanted what they wouldn't have wanted um but um yeah that's why it's just important to and i'll add, and and i'll work on this more as i um um as i get into this career more i'll definitely it's definitely one of my uh like top projects in my head that like we need to normalize this more yes i've noticed a lot of issues in life that i notice that might bug me is because people are avoiding it and then living through the day in basically what i would call a dead state it's kind of a waste of their yeah, existence yeah, yeah. somebody i know who has been on the show actually before but she's 33 and had uh, like a stroke a series of kind of minor strokes because of moya moya this condition mm-hmm. and uh she didn't really plan on that at probably 32 right exactly. did she plan that no she didn't exactly so there's a bit of like it happens it it's going to show up it's going to show up it happens i saw i saw covid related strokes in 32 33 year olds um did that 32 year old think about this no he didn't Right. Uh, had never thought but it happened right it happened um so it comes and it's and it's very difficult to make those decisions those decisions when 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 the crap is happening in real time mm-hmm. because you're emotionally charged family is emotionally charged um the your thought process is hindered because of what you're going through um so there's some things that um and especially especially even if like fine healthy people who have nothing going on sure even if you want to delay it for later on especially those who already have underlying conditions um um and especially those who are 50 and above i would say mm-hmm. um especially those who are already um uh, battling with some sort of condition that is like a no brainer those people have to must be thinking about these things and and doctors should be talking to them about this um because if you don't talk about it like i said we feel it's too early until when it's too late and i've seen countless examples of um and they're very heartbreaking because um you cuz i always question what would he have thought or asked me to do if he was in a position to make this decision right now the problem is now he can't so now everybody is making decisions on his behalf right so then you work through the law and you um and you 
um, speak to the spouse or the children or the parents who are the you know next of kin and everything there's a whole ladder that you follow it's not exactly the same but like you know like i often wonder we're making this decision but if this person was able to feel what's happening to him or her right now and was able to voice his or her opinion would he have still wanted to do the same thing right. um, um, and I, I encounter this far too often and it, and it, and it leaves you with some sort of guilt as well, because, because what works for you doesn't necessarily work for someone else. So everybody is entitled to their own judgment and assessment of how they want things to be when they're not able to make, and it's not even just death. You, this could be a temporary situ- situation, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that temporarily you're not able to make your decisions. Um, and then later on you recover and you get back to your, um, so in that temporary moment, um, just some things to understand and, and um, know, know what happens in the hospital. I think that's the big thing that I always notice is that people don't know. Um, and it's, um, and it's, 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 it's not about why they don't know, but it's just about the general system that w- what should you expect and what should you know about how things go Mm-hmm. Um, when someone is admitted in the hospital with a very serious critical condition. Um, I have come across people who need a ventilator, like right now, and this is pre-COVID, right? I, I need to put you on a ventilator and he doesn't know what a ventilator is. So then like, you know, so to, so to even be, just to even know whether or not he wants it, I have to first explain what it means what are the chances of him coming out of it? What happens if he doesn't come out of it? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is not something, and most of these people are, 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 are patients who are dealing with these diseases for quite a long period of time. It's not like something has happened out of the blue. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what is it? So why is it that they're still, that right in the moment when they need a ventilator, um, my, the first step that we have to take is also to ex- first explain what it is to even ask if they want it. Mm-hmm. Some people learn about it and they're like, Hey, no, <laughs> let me, I don't want to be on a ventilator like that. Right. Cause you don't know what it is, right? Like common, common, it's not common knowledge. How does a ventilator look? What happens? What's the chance that you will come out of it? What's the chance that you won't come out of it? What happens when they don't come out of it? Right. What's next? What to expect? Cause it's like a whole thing. And then. And then, um, so I often fight with that guilt also. What if I'm doing this right now, which I feel is in his best interest, right. he wouldn't have wanted it if he knew what was to come, right? So, um, so these questions should be, um, yeah, these discussions should be um, more ubiquitous than they are in clinics, in living rooms, on dining tables. Um, just being prepared for things that we know will come. Mm-hmm. So why run away from it and then um, and then regret things later? I don't support that kind of running. Mm-hmm. One kind of, I guess, a closing remark that came to mind is that I always talk about leadership and the importance of that. Uh, there's very few leaders and then those people are key. If you take them away, things change. Uh, individual at your hospital, I looked it up too, and is no longer here because of in relation to the virus. How I was does about that... to mention him, actually. Say again? He was, I was about to mention him. Oh. Now, how does that impact... How did that impact people? How, what was the feel after that? The, yeah. He, I, I couldn't have had a conversation on this crisis without mentioning Dr. Gamholz. He was, he was the chairman of my department, actually. So he was the chairman of the Department of Medicine. He, he was not just a leader. He was not just the chairman of the department. He was an exemplary, like we used to call him encyclopedia clinician. He was an exemplary clinician, oh. physician, teacher, like the way he would teach us, nobody else ever did that. Um, an exemplary human being. He was the chairman and his, and his office's door would always remain open for any of us to barge in discuss our issues with him, whether it was about our patients or about our future um, or about some research. So he was just someone and he was so invested in medicine. And at the same time, he knew like three, four different languages. 
he had learned how to fly a plane. He, um, um, he loved his food. He loved his wine. Um, he was a great husband. He was a wonderful father, a wonderful grand grandfather. So he was just, and everybody in New York knows him. He's, he's worked in multiple healthcare systems. Um, even, a, even outside New York, actually, like he's a very well-known name. So he, he was just, I was just so blessed that I got, I'm actually the last graduating class that he got to see. Um, and I was, and I was blessed to be under his, um, uh, under him for three years. Like I, I, I'm the last, per, I'm the last class. Yeah. I'm from the last class that he's going to be overseeing. Um, and, and he was 70 plus and we all knew, so did he, that coming to the hospital during the crisis at this age is full of risks. He knew that. Um, but at the same time, what I deduce from the kind of person he was is also that um, he was just not that sort of a person who would expect his residents, his trainees, who he actually called colleagues all the time. He called us colleagues. Um, he was also the kind of person who never expected his colleagues to do what he wasn't doing himself. Oh. And, he, I, and, and he didn't care about his age. Um, he knew what risk he was getting exposed to, but till he, his last breath, he never saw patients directly because he was in a leadership capacity. He, um, he wasn't a clinician any longer, but till his last breathing moment, he continued to teach us because that was one of his primary, um, it was one of the activities he was always very passionate about teaching us, teaching us, teaching us. And he was a, uh, he was a lung specialist himself. He was a pulmonary critical care. So this was like his, his jam. The whole coronavirus epidemic was like his thing. Oh. So till the last day, he was teaching us everything about COVID. He was phenomenal in reading x-rays and CT scans. And he would spot things that even radiologists after extensive training they were not able to spot that he was able to spot, even though radiology is not his niche, mm -hmm. but that's just how brilliant he was. And my biggest takeaway from his death is that it was basically, it was the biggest blow of this crisis. It was like, everything started to settle down a little bit and then boom, our own chairman who we loved so much. Um, I always saw a grandfather in him. Um, he dies off COVID. Um, the, the biggest takeaway I have is that he died, but he's left his legacy of his principles and values. He worked till the last day. Um, he worked in the capacity of a leader. We needed more ventilators. He got them. We needed more oxygen machines. He got them. We needed more nursing staff. He got them because he was the chair of the department, right? So he was part of the leadership of the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, till the last day he was doing that. And at the same time, he didn't stop teaching us. So twice a week, we would always gather in pre-COVID times. It was our routine as part of our schedule pre-COVID that we would gather in groups of um, 20, 25 people twice a week where he would teach us extensively for an, an entire hour. So now those teaching sessions were not possible anymore, but he didn't stop teaching us. Um, he started going around from team to team, um, gathering smaller groups, like two, three people at a time, distanced, wearing masks, etc. but continuing to teach us, continuing to show us how to appreciate the CT scans and the x-rays and predominantly focusing on COVID, obviously. Mm -hmm. So just constantly teaching and basically working till the last day, till the day he gets a fever um, and everybody around him pushed him home because they're like, what are you doing? You need to be home. And he's like, oh my God, I have a fever today. I, I learned that he discovered that fever at work. Um, and then they pushed him home and they said, you need to be home. And then within a week, he exa his condition exacerbated so much that he had to be in the medical ICU. And then a month later, he died. So um, it was, he was a backbone of the, of the entire program. He was someone we looked forward to 
um, seeing, always had a smile on his face. Um, and, and I cried when he died. I cried for like two days straight, actually. I bought like a baby the next morning, actually, um, because that's, I just couldn't believe it. Like, what are the odds that, of, that the chairman of one of the biggest departments affected by COVID-19 dies um, of COVID-19? And I, my guess is that he was exposed at work. Um, um, so it was a huge blow for all of us. Um, but what what stays with us again, sticking to the um, holding on to things that help us move forward are um, trying our level best to be his torchbearer, to to continue living for the values and the principles that he lived for till this till his last day, basically. Um, in fact, even when he was in the ICU, up till the point up till before the point he was on a ventilator, mm -hmm. he was teaching even when he was in the ICU. So he was teaching like online, even when he was in the ICU on the high flow nasal cannula. Um, and things only stopped when he was finally on a ventilator and he had to be sedated. Um, so that man was trying to work in his capacity till the last day, basically. Um, and that's like, where do you see that? Um, Full force. So yeah, so so I was I, I'm I'm blessed that I saw that that I, I that I saw his example um, that I was inspired by his example um, every day for three years and um, and after processing his death a little bit even though I haven't processed it fully um, the only thing that keeps me going. Um, is the fact that if I keep his values, his philosophy, his philanthropy, his his principles, his passion for medicine, for not just for medicine, for helping people in ways that you wouldn't even imagine, um, and and not an ounce of pride for anything he's done all his life. I think that's like you know, like he um, even when he would like tell us the. Um, even when he would teach us or, or tell us things we, we weren't able to think, for example, in, in, in brainstorming, um, even when he would come up with like obscure diagnosis, it was never to like show off his knowledge. It was always done in a manner where he was giving us some gift that today we learned this from him. This was our companionship with him. Um, and I think I'm gonna keep his picture on my work desk. Actually, I've, I've, um, I'm gonna get a desk. Uh, I'm starting a new job um, in July, so I've already thought of the fact that I'm gonna keep a picture on his picture on my work desk, just to keep reminding myself of and always thinking of uh, thinking about things from his perspective. What would he have done um, if he were in this position? Because it's just, um, yeah we lost a legend basically and if if it were not for covid he would have lived for easily a decade more so but um yeah just just a man full of life full of exceptional abilities um and not an ounce of pride for anything so i think that's the biggest thing like you will find learned people you will find um um, people who've achieved a lot. You will find people who've taken multiple leadership opportunities. Um, those are not hard to find. You will find those, you know, exemplary people all the time. But all of that, while keeping your door open, never wanting any appointment, um, always a smile on his face, not an ounce of pride for anything he's done ever. Um, I think his the way he was approachable, even with an age difference of what forty years, fifty years with, from all of us, and always addressing us as colleagues. Every single email of his addressed us as colleagues, not residents, not trainees, nothing. It was forty, fifty years apart, right? And he would call us colleagues. So, yeah. So if there's he died, but his values can remain immortal if we carry them forward. And them and then after us when our descendants carry them forward so and that's how you keep him alive and really bear his torch so yeah it was um 
it was it was quite a blow after all of this things had begun to settle down and and everybody thought we were feeling better but we were not feeling better because even though um prices wise the hospitals had started seeing some light we knew he was in the icu and he was not doing well and we knew we had a hunch we all had a hunch that he's not going to make it because you know um when 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 things go certain when they go down the hill and and you you understand what's going on you have a sense of whether this person will make it or not i knew he will not make it um but um yeah so that was another blow actually but um yeah so just trying to um handle it as best as we can honestly makes sense it's almost like it would be written into a story such that there's a decline it's improving yeah. but there's this last thing and yeah. oh i hope this works out because that would mean it was like all good across the board and ask me hey so things might be better now um how's the hospital census now you know covid has come down and it's true things had become better um census had come down and and we had started seeing light at work there's no doubt about that um but we all had that all of us who whoever loved him who, whose life he had touched in one way or another we all had just that that lump in our throat that i know things are better but he he's in the icu he's still in the icu it's been a month um and it's it's not going well we knew that um but for as long as he's alive we were still holding on to things obviously um until one day he wasn't so yeah it sounds like he was low on ego and high on giving absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely just uh giving without ever expecting this thing or that making you feel that he's giving you know like it's not just giving they just just magical ability to to give and and enjoy it with you and just keep giving without ever making you feel that he gave you that make you feel indebted or whatever that he he gave you something um so i think that's a very like that's a trait that's hard to find you will find accomplished people but yeah someone who's able to strike that point as well where here genuinely he genuinely gives because he has so much experience so many contacts so many resources so much intellect he was able to give us so much in different capacities without ever ever making and it wasn't just like those under him like when he died his his the the wall of tribute was filled with people from different areas of life because that's he was just a person who would touch the life of whoever he came across in one way or another um so his his wall was like filled with tributes from people of all sorts of um backgrounds walks of life who were recalling instances of how he had touched their lives and and um and like and and people were recalling how he always remembered my birthday he always remembered my maiden name you know like like acknowledging human beings around you in ways that make them feel involved engaged special that's what people were recalling he always remembered my birthday who remembers strangers birthdays <laughs> He always remembered my maiden name. Someone wrote that. He always remembered my maiden name. Who remembers someone's maiden name? Like like these days like people for example, you know, it's what whatever but it's just something like um they'll they'll message you your name is written there. Um and they will still write the wrong spelling. <laughs> right? Your your name is right there. It's there. but the, and and he was someone who remembered someone's name that's not even part of her name anymore <laughs> um so that's just you know that just shows how engaged he was um and how and and how he made um people feel right um, yeah so so those are the things that you know you yeah that's what i want to um take inspiration from um as much as i can i can never be him but as much as i can a little bit of whatever he tried to do is um really the only um consolation i can give myself
I would like to say in this moment, which maybe there be future ones, we may have Mariam on the show in the future, but at this current moment, you have brought there's so many life messages. Seriously, I could break down the ego point, the the grouping people people grouping together point. There's so many like life points we just covered. I just want to point out. We basically covered some of the key the, everything. <laughs> <laughs> the mortality. The there's so many points across. We covered but, quite a few topics. And and I'm and I'm so glad that this was a spontaneous conversation because there's nothing better than that. True that. Long live spontaneity. Always on each episode I like to have at the end a point. What is a message you would want to tell to all of humanity about something you'd want them to know or something you'd want to say to all people of the earth if you had like a megaphone? Hmm. That maybe represents something about you or something you'd want them to know. Just a megaphone. I think, um, there are several and I could go on and on, but one, one big recurring realization and reminder that I give myself as well, because you know, nobody's, nobody's perfect and, and we always fall short. We always fall short. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I think just thinking about, um, people from their perspective that helps a lot because it's um like always yeah it's just something that like someone could be screaming at you right now someone could be getting angry with you right now i'm not saying justify wrong with that but 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 step back and think about that same moment that same issue from the other person's shoes um and it it helps me in in being able to be more compassionate in being able to be more um more thoughtful more sympathetic um you may never be able to live what they're living um, but if you just, you know, if you just step back and if you think, okay, I know he's, he appears unfair right now, but he or she appears unfair right now, but, but what is it from his or her perspective that I should also include in my analysis right now? Um, so yeah, every, like anytime, anytime you, you feel, um, uh, you feel like something's wrong and you have your own perspective to defend, um, think about the other perspective as well. Um, there's never just one perspective and, and no perspective is ever right. Um, no one perspective is ever right. There are aspects of different perspectives and it just, it just helps to bring people closer um, rather than the divide that it would lead to otherwise because we're quick at we're quick at defending our own perspectives and and i you know i've been through it i still i still do it you know like something comes up and i have my perspective over it and i'm quick to defend it but then know that the other person has his or her own perspective that is equally um defendable so um whether it's something small or something about larger public issues um just having, uh, and, and this mask example is just one, right? Like, I know this is something very simple. What's the problem? It's like, if it costs a cent, like, why can't you wear a mask? But, but, but there has to be a reason why they're not doing it, despite everything. They're, they're, they're watching the same TV. They're watching the same news that you are. Um, they're also scared. Everybody's scared for their life, right? Why are, still the, why are they still not wearing it? Um, delve into it. Think about it. Um, um, look at their perspective because if you just focus on yours, um, it's just going to create a divide and it's not going to, um, you want to bring people closer to make good things happen. That's how good things happen. Divide never, never does any good. Right. So, um, thinking about other people's perspective, I think has, um, more lately helped me in, um, just making more sense of why something happens. Um, yeah, good or bad. That's one. I could say millions of other things, but I think it's like enough to end this. 
We'll save that for a future one there. That's yep, classic. Exactly. <laughs> Dr. Mariam Bakir, I would like to thank you for having been on this wonderful episode of thank the show. Thank you for this opportunity. This was, this was wonderful. I, I really like how spontaneous this conversation was. You know it, and we are out.